Uh, hi again, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Inside Furman Athletics. I am Dan Scott, the voice of the Paladins. It is our monthly visit with Athletic Director Jason Donnelly, who is here. Matt Davidson, the men's golf coach, is here. And we have a very special golf coach on the phone line that we're going to be bringing in direct from the tournament that his women's team is playing. Jeff Hull is with us, albeit briefly, but he's with us as well. Boss, how you doing? I'm doing great. Wait, let me turn you up there. There you go. I'm doing great. And uh, before we get started with Jeff, just want to give a shout-out to Lane Baker. Um, we just had a really nice reception that, that Matt was at, and, and so many people from the Furman community, um, strength coaches, trainers, administrators, coaches, um, members of the, of the Furman community, retirees, legends at Furman, uh, all the folks that, that you would have known if you were here as a student athlete or as a coach in the past, uh, but just a great shout out to Elaine Baker for her 39 years of service, according to Hunter Reed, and um, just the impact that she's had on our department. I, I am immensely grateful personally uh, for her leadership. Um, one thing people might might not know, we might be the only, maybe the only athletic department in the country that went the entire year without losing a single competition to COVID. And it was really easy to lose competitions. We didn't have a whole lot of control. Um, but we put Elaine in charge of, of all of that when it came to how we operated athletically with all of our policies and procedures. Um, all of our coaches, student athletes have immense respect for her and her staff. And uh, we were very fortunate to stay healthy and get through an entire year without it. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. But um, Elaine's leadership, not just at Furman, but in the Southern Conference as a pioneer in women's sports, sports medicine, sports performance. And, um, and she's leaving at a time where we are just so thankful for her friendship, but uh, but a shout out to Elaine for the great work that she's done for Furman Athletics for so long. Well, I'm I'm glad there was a great turnout for that. I had to stay here and get this ready to go for our uh, recording this afternoon. But uh, it was also nice to see at the Wofford game at the Well a week ago this past Saturday, her get the recognition out at half court and the the ovation that she got from the Furman folks who understand what she has meant to this university during her 39 years here. Yeah, and one of the things that blows me away about Furman, and this is a shout-out to both Matt and Jeff, um, there's something in the Furman DNA. There's a really unique humility to this place that the folks that work here that have had tremendous success and have dedicated so much, they don't want any credit. And when this came up with her, we, we kind of had to beg her to say, hey, Elaine, this is really important not just for you but for everybody around you and for them to have an opportunity to, to recognize you. And at the Wofford game, that was something that we were able to do and um, kind of surprised her. I didn't tell her that we were inviting her staff to join her on the floor. <laughs> and she was surprised and in tears of joy. Um, but we're really thankful for Elaine and thankful for so many people that have been a part of Furman Athletics for so long. I think the reason our, pa- our fan base is so passionate is because of these great people. And uh, really excited to have one of those legends here with us. Um, I love walking into um, <laughs> I love walking into Furman Golf uh, Course and going into the clubhouse. And I see Matt's picture there amongst the legends. But... We're going to segue over to another legend uh, who's done a great job for us, Coach Jeff Hole. who, Matt, we should probably buy some real estate in Hilton Head for Furman because you guys are there so much. You were just there. I know. We, we missed them by a couple days. They oh. got down there right oh. after different, different golf courses. But and right I need to rearrange them. my schedule because i got to spend more time hanging with these guys because I don't think there's any better job in America than being a golf coach, especially at a place like Furman. I mean, it's got to be the best job in America. There's, I'm not complaining. <laughs> I, sure. I, I don't know. Je- Jeff, Jeff nice Holes. He's, he's the one out there competing right now. So depending on what, what shots or holes he's at right now, yeah, it might be different. Je- Jeff has the women's program uh, at the uh, Darius Rucker event uh, down in Hilton Head. Uh, we're recording this on Monday afternoon, so he's actually joining us during a break in the action. Is it the best coaching job on campus, Jeff Hull? <laughs> Well, it's certainly a great job. I don't know if it's stress free or not. I mean, when I got to Furman, I, I had no I had no gray hair at all, and now it looks like Santa Claus. So. <laughs> Jeff, well, I, I love that you're taking away uh, some time with us here, especially the fact, um, and I think this is a great compliment, not just to Furman women's golf, but to women's golf in general. The fact that this is being a televised live event on the Golf Channel. Can you tell us a little bit what you're going through right now uh, in Hilton Head, so the fans know this experience you and the team are having? Well, I mean, it's it's definitely probably the premier college event in the country outside of the NCAA's uh, tremendous field. Um, and, you know, to have Darius Rucker's name attached to it, we have a concert tonight. Um, but they've got over 100 volunteers down here. I mean, it's better than some tour events uh, that are out there. So they do a tremendous job. We're so fortunate uh, to have been a part of this every year. 
And, uh, and for this year, you know, to be the very first televised women's golf event, you know, outside of the national championship is pretty special. So de- definitely a good vibe out here. Tough conditions, pretty windy, really good golf course. So just trying to, you know, keep them going in the right direction. And it's pretty cool to be a part of history like that. Uh, and, and we just passed, I don't know if you guys know this, but we just passed another very historic date uh, where Furman is concerned, the uh, anniversary of, of Frank Selvey's 100-point yes. game. Do you know that that was the first live televised, televised event, sporting event in the state of South Carolina? Really? Did you know that? No, absolutely. No, yeah. that's amazing. So, and I don't think, I mean, you, for Furman fans, I think obviously you appreciate how great it's been and, and all the experiences with, with Frank Selvey, but Frank Selvey's game, you know, because of that national TV, TV broadcast, TV broadcast, it went everywhere. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, one of the first things when I got the job at Furman, be like, Frank Selvey. I said, everyone knows Frank right. Selvey because of that game. Um, so this is a great opportunity, obviously, for TV, for women's golf to have that type of exposure. But Jeff, how do you think we line up, and what are, what are some of your thoughts in terms of preparation and and how you're going to go through things this week? Well, we had a really good week of practice um, trying to prepare for this because we know the golf course so well, we know the conditions. Um, and they're responding. I mean, it's been tough, uh, but you know, we're, you know, we're the, every team here is ranked. Um, and so it's a, it's a tough field, but we're, we're hanging right in there. We're kind of, we're kind of middle of the pack right now. Um, and we're kind of coming into some holes that maybe we can, you know, maybe we can get some, uh, some strokes back on. Um, but it's just really just trying to right. And this golf course is such a mentally challenging golf course because you just have to really grind it out and just make sure you stay, stay in the present. You know, you, you and I watch golf. We've got a guy here who actually played it and coached it. Maybe we should let him play the role of interviewer and ask a question or, or two. You, you, you want to you take on the, uh, the role of uh, sure. interviewer here, Matt I mean, Davidson? I've, I've, been, I've been following the scores pretty closely. That's an enormous tournament. I don't, think they, I don't think there's a school in the field outside the top 50. Jeff can correct me. So uh, amazing field. So um, they look like they've gotten off to a solid start. Um, pretty windy down there, Jeff. Yeah, it's below in 15 to 20 pretty yeah. steady. So Yeah, I know it's a course with a lot of trouble, a lot of hazards, so 15 to 20 miles per hour. I mean, it's it, it gets to be survival out there, I'm, I'm sure, just trying to hit fairways and, and greens. But what uh, what hole are you on now, Jeff? We just made the turn, so we're just uh, starting the third hole, which is the par 5, so it's our 12th hole. And it's a, probably one of the best par 5s I've ever played. I mean, it's just got all kinds of challenge to it, really tough green. Um and if the weather's such that, I mean, even the Gators aren't out today. I mean, there's not even a Gator <laughs> setting themselves. So, so that'll kind of tell you what the weather's like. Anna, get off to a pretty good start. Looks like she's, she's playing well. Yeah, Anna. You know, it's funny. Uh, Anna, was she's really got a good attitude right now. And, uh, you know, I, I caught her on 13. And she goes, hey, can you read this putt? So I read the putt, and she made it. So that was good. There and go. Mackenzie, caught her, Mackenzie caught her on 16, and she drained about a 30, 40-footer. So that was good. Um, so, yeah, we're just kind of cruising along. Good. Well, you got some good practice with the wind because uh, just a week or so ago you were out in Las Vegas and some windy conditions as a part of the Spanish Trail where you finished fourth. But um, we're obviously talking about Anna Morgan as well as fifth. But how do you feel how you've done to date so far, Jeff? And you're just getting your season started off the ground in the spring, but how do you feel so far? I mean, I think we're doing well. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, kind of a young team. We've got a small team. So now it's just a matter of we have to, uh, you know, just make sure, you know, that, that – we kind of keep going, and, and again, it doesn't really matter how you play now, and it kind of does, but you just have to try to keep building for the postseason. You know, we just need to be ready for SOCON and then regionals and hopefully get to nationals. Good. We're going to talk to Matt uh, about this uh, when, when we let you go here in just a minute, but from your standpoint, tell us what impact the uh, the Davis and Faxon indoor facility ha- has already had on your program, but the impact it's going to have on the future from actual improving your strokes to recruiting and everything that goes into it? Well, I think it's, it's helped us already because we're able to practice in some bad weather that we might have missed in the past. Um, and then, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, we've got everything we need. Now. We've got a great golf course. We've got wonderful short game area. And now the building just kind of completes it. So we're just really excited, you know, about that. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, to have the facility that we have and, and the technology that's inside it is, is really good. So, Matt, no excuses, right? <laughs> no, I guess so. He's putting the pressure on us. Yeah, um, yeah. Ditto what what Jeff said. It's you know the the player development with the technology and 
you know, Jeff's a great instructor. You know, J James and I and Mackenzie, we all work with work with the uh, guys and the girls on their game. So player development side will be great. And then recruiting, it's it's just like any other sport. It's a non-revenue sport, but it's still an arms race. And there's some great facilities going up. To, so to have that and, and kind of some recruiting battles is, is huge too. Yeah, and I was going to say the same thing. I mean, facilities matter. Um, history and tradition of the program, the yes. success of the program, the commitment of the alumni, the way that they're engaged with the program, outstanding coaches, outstanding culture, uh, extremely competitive. I mean, I, my hat goes off to Matt for what he's building with this program on the men's side. Um, and, and Jeff has the program position exactly how you want it to be. That doesn't mean any year is going to be easy. It's it's one of those things when I was coaching, we used to say, well, the other team's trying to win too. Yep. And you've got the competition. Every time you raise the bar in terms of where your expectations are, the people around you do the same or you're, you're working to keep up. But um, I thought for anyone that was associated with Furman Golf, and we had our trustees there, we had our donors there, we had – alumni there, uh, the Davis and Faxon facility opening might have been one of the finest events that we've ever had at Furman um, in my time, and people that have been here a long time before me have said the same. They said that's one of the first class events we've ever had. But can, can you – we'll go to Matt first, and I definitely want to go to you, Jeff, as well. But can you talk about the impact of that evening on your program and for you personally in terms of what that was? Yeah, it was it was a special night, and I knew, you know, Cindy and, and Brad, I knew, you know, Cindy Davis and Brad Faxon um, – that it was going to be a big night for them and then they were touched they were i mean there was it impacted them probably even more than i thought it would but just all the alumni women's golf alums men's golf alums friends supporters everybody who's kind of you know was 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 here a, a little you know seven eight years ago and before then just to see where we've come and, and could have a night like that and have a facility like this it was it was um i wouldn't say a culmination because we're still you know we're still building we're still trying to get better but it was it was um it was special to see how far we've how far we've come and and for everybody to to celebrate it at once like that it was it was pretty amazing. And Jeff, what were your thoughts? I mean, you, you, I was teasing you because you, you wore a jacket and I didn't realize you owned a blazer. Um, I've only seen you in, in, in golf attire, which which I love. But Jeff, what were your thoughts on that special evening? Oh, I mean, it was it was amazing. I mean, the way it was done, it was done in a very classy yet very casual way, and I thought it was it was very very well done. And you know, having very, really been great to be able to get to know Cindy like I have uh, over the last couple of years and and to just see her excitement with that building and to see the the amount of emotion that she has you know for it uh, is 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 really neat and uh, you know again you know to have somebody like Brad who's a kind of a legend in the game and Cindy who's you know kind of a legend in the in the corporate world um, it's outstanding you know and yeah, I mean, believe it or not, I do own a coat and a suit. And, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually, I was going to go, I was going to actually get a new one for the event, but I thought, well, you know what? Probably need to go lose a few pounds before I buy a new suit. So I just figured I'd hold on. Well, well you, and the other thing you don't want to do, uh, Jeff, is establish a precedent. <laughs> you know, you know, a, a one time a one time event is okay, but you start establishing a precedent, then you got to start dressing like an AD, and you don't want that. No, you definitely don't want that. I, mi I miss the coaching, <laughs> I miss the coaching attire days. Those were good days. I, I will say, from yeah. my perspective, um, and my hats off to both of you. My hats off to Matt, to Jeff, um, to Ken Pettis, who was a huge part of this, mm -hmm. to Aaron Wissing, to all the facilities folks, and the many donors that gave to this project. The, the leadership around this did. It's one of the, again one of the beauties of Furman. It, it came from both the men's and the women's side, uh, but to have two legends um, with the stature and and the the, the known the well knownness of, of Brad Faxon, and to have Brad there with your team and taking you guys out to dinner and working on putting. I mean, just the ability to have that type of opportunity. And again, this speaks to Furman's humility. Sometimes we don't promote all the great things that we do, um, but also with Cindy Davis's stature internationally to be. Uh, at that level, having run Nike Golf and to have those relationships with the Arnold Palmers and the Tiger Woods and the Rory McIlroy's of the world. I mean, it's just unbelievable what Furman's been able to accomplish. And then you look at the depth of all the great players of the year uh, that have participated in Furman Women's Golf and, and talking about, uh, you know, everyone that was a part of that. And for Natalie Srinivasan to come back and to be at that event, to me, that was one of those, again, those humble moments. But you have the National Golfer of the Year, and we honored her uh, at the basketball game the next day. But uh, her grace and her humility and her success in that situation. But I, I just thought that was one of the best nights that I've been around at Firm, and I just my hat's off to both of you. But what was it like for the guys hanging out with Brad? Because that was a particularly cool they, thing. They had a blast, yeah. Um, just to have that, for them to have the relationship with Brad and pick his brain, but just to know him, like just to, you know, they got his phone number, they read I mean, it's 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 really cool, and, and Brad enjoys it a lot too. He really does. You know, he 
he um he you know tell him stories about his time at Furman with the guys and just you know he's kind of a storyteller anyway so he enjoyed it um and the guys absolutely loved it they just love spending time with him I had a great moment I was I was looking for him and I went up to find him in the clubhouse he's getting dressed for the event because he was yeah. running behind because the Putnam Clinic he did for you guys and uh I was in there with the guys on the team and they were coming in like Mr. Fax and this this and they were telling stories about different courses they were playing and different holes where they got stuck and, and situations they were going through. And, and to see Brad, it almost went – he went from this luminary to being just one of the guys. Oh, yeah. And, and it was just so impressive to see him interact and, and genuinely want to know what they were going through and what it's a part of. And I think it's really one of the beauties of having been a student athlete is that you have this transformative experience when you're in college and you have this opportunity to participate in something really special. Um, to hear Brad talk about the impact of him getting offered a scholarship, a small scholarship yeah. – uh, and what that meant for him to play for Coach Willie Miller, um, and for him to pass up on opportunities elsewhere, and his loyalty to Furman. Um, and loyalty is not always a perfect thing. You know, we all go through ups and downs in terms of where we are with our our alma mater, with our sports, with our faith, with our families. Um, but for Brad and Cindy to engage that way, Jeff. Likewise, you've built an incredible relationship with Cindy. But can you tell a little bit about the impact on her for that evening? If we still have you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I was I had mute on. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing with Cindy is, is you know, she flat said it. She goes, you know, I want this to be, you know, a top tier program. She wants to do everything she can to, to make it great. And I think it's 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 shown just by the way she's, you know, been involved. So it's been outstanding. Jeff, do your, do your players grasp the, the magnitude of, the hit, not just the history of the program, but to have the access to people like Cindy and like the men do with Brad, and, and, and I'm sure there was some crossover there. Do you, do you think your players really grasp what a special uh, situation this is for them? Uh, they do, you know. But again, you got to remember that that you know when when people like Beth and Betsy and Dottie and and Cindy were in school, you know, that was a long, long time ago. So I think. You know, trying to get them to understand the history is, is very important. That's what we try to do. And, and Cindy's been so great to help people. Um, and I think it's great that they know they can just, you know, pick up the phone. And if they have a question, they can they can certainly have her answer. Well, I'll tell you one of the coolest so, things that came out of it, Jeff, is, I mean, you talk about, obviously, the, you know, the Dotties and the Betsies and Bets are, are from a different time period. Um, and we love watching Dottie and her commentary uh, nationally. Um, but one of the things that impressed me the most was talking to Natalie in Srinivasan and to hear her – her enthusiasm for the new facility and her ability to come back and train as a professional um, and also for her interactions with the team. And I said, what are you enjoying the most? She goes, I love coming back and being around the team. But that's such a compliment yeah. to your culture that not yeah. only do student athletes have success here, and it's the same with you, with, you know, with Keller. I mean, yeah. the guys coming back here and they want to be a part of this program, um, it's truly special. And that's why – we have hey, our excuse me real quick. Excuse me, Jason. I'm sorry. I got to run. Real you got to go. Sorry, you got, got Darius go. Rucker. We get it. Yep. We'll watch you on it. national Thanks. TV, Jeff. Good luck. Good luck, Jeff. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guys. Been strong. And just one of the finishing thoughts for us. I mean, I, I have so much um, excitement in it for where these programs are headed. And each of you are on a different trajectory in terms of where you're taking this and where you want it to be. And institutionally, we're working through the process of getting in there. But um, I hope you can feel kind of the build that's going into this in terms of where we're going because we don't have to. We don't have to eclipse the national elite programs that are out there because that's a, that's a hard pill to, to swallow to get there. But our, our job is to continually improve and keep positioning the program further and further because at the end of the day, all it does is take one Brad Faxon to believe in a Furman you know, or one Dottie Pepper to believe in for once Natalie Schoenervasen can change your entire year with the way that you play. But can you what's, – what's some of your thoughts on the future of the program? Yeah, I mean, we're, like you said, we're trying to get better every year. There's, there's a lot that, that goes into this player development, it's recruiting, it's alumni relations, you know, it's, it's fundraising, things like that. But um, we've, I'm confident we've gotten, we've gotten a little bit better every single year the last three or four years. We're, we're now, you know, certainly contending for conference, you know, championships, which is always our main goal. And um, with the facilities in place, the quality of the school, um, location, there's a lot of inherent advantages that I don't see why we can't continue to improve every single year. But, yeah, it's just – just like anything else, is the process of, of developing the players you got, recruiting the right fits for Furman to come in, and then, you know, obviously getting as many people as involved as we can. So just work on that every day and going to keep getting better. And speaking of getting people involved, I know you got an upcoming event this Wednesday. I think it's this Wednesday. You guys are going out to play. Yeah. Yeah. Sage Valley. Yeah. yeah. So next next Wednesday. Next um, Wednesday. Yeah. We, we've, we're, we're playing a, a 
Oh, yeah, collegiate event at, at Palmetto Golf Club Monday and Tuesday, USC Aikens event. Um, pretty great golf course, um, good field, UVA, South Carolina, Virginia Tech will be some of the better teams there. And then the day after, um, out at Sage Valley, which is right near Aiken, which uh, a former teammate of mine, Tom Wyatt, his father, Weldon Wyatt, uh, built Sage Valley. So with the help of Tom and with Mercer, who also had, had a member out at Sage Valley, we're going to do a little one-on-one -on -one match with Mercer the day after the uh, Palmetto event ends. It's going to be fun. It's not going to you know, be rankings-based. Mm -hmm. It'll be kind of two-on-two matches because I think the guys would, would actually prefer to kind of have a little fun coming the day after a tournament like that. Um, but it'll be a good experience, and we're going to bring up a couple of the seniors that, that don't see as much action are going to come up and, and be a part of that too. So for them to you know represent Furman like that, again, it's going to be a neat day. Well, I, I love Mercer the, versus Furman I love Sage Valley. Love what you're doing. I love the family atmosphere that you built. Um, I know that the Furman means more to you and your wife than it does for others because of your background here and, and, and involvement, not just athletically but academically. Um, but this, to me, this is the exact, greatest example. You've got an alumnus that's got a course. You've got the whole team participating on the spring break. Um, I've got it circled on my calendar as a day because I would love to go out there and watch you guys you play. Come out. It'd be fun. And Jim Cole at Mercer's become a really good friend, and he is very competitive with everything. Um, everything. So I would, there's nothing that would make me happier than to see you guys take on Mercer and, 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 uh, and knock him down a notch. But yep. it's, it'll be a fun time. It'll be fun. Yeah, we're going to play, play four better ball, four, four two-on-two better ball matches. Oh, nice. It's going to be a blast. Before you go, I, I've got a question. And when we did this three weeks ago, we, we didn't get into this. Yep. But, you know, we're just talking on the women's side, all of those names and what they've mm -hmm. meant to the program. In, in, in essence, you're kind of one of those names that has meant something along those lines to the Furman men's program. And now you've come back to coach the program. Is, is that – pressure is it motivation how do you look at, at this opportunity you've got now considering your status as a, a outstanding player here during your career yeah I mean definitely not motivation I, mean, I, I, I think I probably feel um, a little bit more of a responsibility yeah. maybe than if I came mm -hmm. come from somewhere else you know I care deeply about this program I was a part of it um you know, I think it's it's advantageous in a lot of things we do with alumni. You know, I know we do certain things where we're reaching out to a lot of people, and it's it's nice to have, you know, the names kind of in your phone already because you pretty much, you know, have, have, have been around uh, everybody at least, you know, 10, 15 years in either, either direction of me. Um, so it definitely it, it helps. Um, it Like Jeff said, it's it's nice for the Stu the current students to kind of realize, you know, even on the men's side, how how many Southern Conference championships we won, and all Americans, and guys like Brad Faxon and Todd Whites and Frank Fords and uh, Strong, uh, you know, David Strongs. There's, there's, you know, and, and and not for that to be a burden to them, you know, uh, pressure wise either, but just to to have that responsibility for them too, to know that you know this is a really high standard. It's a program that that has a lot of tradition. Has been good for a while. You know, you gotta you gotta put in the time and, and yeah. the dedication to live up to that. You, oh. you, you mentioned a name there. I had dinner with Todd White on Saturday. Did you? After yeah. the Citadel Great game, player. David Cobb and I, I think they were college roommates, and so yep. we went to dinner uh, after the game. Angel yeah. and I went out with him and. Uh, and David did a great job um, organizing an alumni event in Charleston. So he actually apologized. He put it together and left to do radio with you, which yeah. I loved. Um, but we had a great. We'll talk about that when we talk about the other sports, but. A great weekend there that David led down in Charleston when the men's basketball team was there for Citadel. I will tell you this, Matt. One of the comments that meant a lot to me during the, facts, the Davidson Faxon event um, was something that Brad had said, and I think it's a great tribute to, to what you're doing. You talk about the responsibility and the love that we have for Furman Goff. Furman Goff went through a hard, hard period of time, yeah, and people like Frank Ford uh, and Rob Langley and, and, and Brad Faxon, they, they were among the leaders that got, that, got the program through that time. Uh, with more work to do. But I think part of the appreciation this group has had, and I give you a lot of credit for this, is the everyone, the closeness, the togetherness, the collaboration, the belief, the process of building something really special. It, it's something you can feel with the student athletes, you can feel it with the parents, you can feel it with the alumni, you can feel it with the trajectory of the program, um, which is why I'm so excited for you leading the program. Um, and I'm hoping that you're going to be here for a long, long time Thanks, uh, raising your family here. It was great to meet. Also, you know, from New Jersey, you meet Jersey people, you know that you can connect. <laughs> That's right. I love that connection as well. But um, my last question for you, Mac, is we want to see you guys and we want to support you. Yep. Um, with the exception of the Southern Conference tournament, is there a tournament coming up that you'd say, hey, if we could all get out, if the Furman fans 
could gather and get behind the team? Is there a time and place where you say, hey, this would be a really good thing for, for all of us to do? We, we try to do those things when you have your on-campus events, but this year that's not the case. But where would you say we all gather and meet up with you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Augusta event is on a weekend, um, which I know is helpful for people. It's, it's uh, April 2nd and 3rd or 1st and 2nd, 2nd and 3rd. That's Saturday yep. and Sunday. Right, um, right before the Masters. Right before the Masters, and um, that's going to be a huge event. We, we've got a, we've got some big ones coming up. The Georgia Southern event, the Shankle down Statesboro mid March is, is is huge, and then we we go to Charleston uh, Darius Rucker. It's called the Hootie at Bulls Bay event, it's sort of a, a, a Darius Rucker uh, awesome. sponsor event too on the men's side in Charleston the week after, and then Augusta is the week after that. So the very beginning of April, the Haskins Award Invitational. Um, it's going to be a going to be a heck of a field. A lot of top twenty teams and. And uh, not too far. I wish we were a little, you know, I wish we had one, one right right on campus at our, our home event. We're, we're going to do that in the fall. Next fall, we'll have the Furman Intercollegiate again. Um, so, yeah, if everyone wants to come down to Augusta, it's a good place to be that time of year, too. Uh, yeah, they, they, they know a little bit about golf yeah, now. It's, there, it's don't a they? good place to be that time of year, yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan's going to wind up going from basketball season straight. He's like, can we do golf? Can <laughs> I do some? He'll be the Jim Nance of the SoCon. They give, yeah. uh, they give all the, all the, the players – Monday practice round tickets the day after the tournament's over. Coaches, too, thankfully. So, so cool. they give you seven uh, practice round tickets to the Monday uh, at, at Augusta there right after the event. So we'll stay, you know, we'll stay the extra night. Hopefully everybody's professional. You, work, you, okay you, you found a way to work around. that into the budget, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we yeah. got the hotel for one more night for sure. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to have fun out there. Well, they lost the van because they hit a deer recently. So, I mean, there's been all kinds of, yeah. all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on, but – um, Matt, we're very thankful for your leadership. We're very thankful for your team, your culture. Uh, very thankful for the commitment of our alumni and everything they've done. The parents, it's been it's been impressive to say the least. So Thank congratulations. You, I appreciate it. Thank you. All Thanks, right. Dan. That is Matt Davidson. Uh, while we uh, take a moment to transition here, take a look at the upcoming Southern Conference basketball brackets. We'll be talking about basketball with Jason here in just a moment. But uh, the men's bracket first. I think you can see that small type there. The the Paladins will be playing the 6 o'clock game against the winner of Mercer and Western Carolina to uh, to get things rolling. Uh, on Saturday, it'll be the third of four games on quarterfinal Saturday. The women open on Thursday, and uh, Jackie Carson's team will play the final game of the day as they'll play Chattanooga in that first-round matchup. And, man, what a way they have closed the season. Uh, and, and to do it in the style that they did it uh, in their final game on Saturday, um, Tierra Hodges with a career-high 29 and leading them. They're the number three seed. I think they had a season that probably exceeded the expectations of a lot of people if you look at the absolute youth that Jackie had on her roster, Jason, but it helps when you have somebody like Tierra Hodges decide to come back and play her final year. Yeah, and that's exactly the conversations that Jackie and I were having before the year. Jackie was going into the year apprehensive, saying, I've got a younger – She, I knew it, we talked about it – younger roster coming through. She had some players that got some experience last year that were coming back, um, a number of, number of transitional points. And uh, to Jackie's credit, she did a great job of re-recruiting Tierra to come back for an additional year – which would qualify as her COVID year, and the university, myself, everyone around it, very supportive. And, and if, if Tierra Hodges is not the player of the year in the Southern Conference on the women's side, I don't know who is because I don't know what more you need to do to lead, produce, score, rebound, just make your entire team better. And, and Jackie early on played a very aggressive schedule in the non-conference on purpose. Uh, she was trying to balance it with some, some games that were really hard, um, they went on a stretch where they went on a lot of road games and a couple other games that in her mind, she's like, I just need to get some rhythm games so we can actually learn how to play together. Um, they went through a preseason where they weren't really sure how this was all going to come together. Right before Christmas, they weren't. They were, they were kind of flatlining a little bit. And during the winter break, as they came back, the preparation going into the season and that first weekend on the road for them, I think their first road series when they went to Sanford and Mercer, they got great confidence having beaten Mercer on the road. Uh, who's going to be the number one seed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that the only loss they have is to Furman. And um, they took Sanford down to the wire. But one of the things I was thinking about as we're sitting with Matt, and, and this is just something that I process a lot as, a, as an athletic director, um, from day one since I got here, one of the best parts of my job is the quality and the character of our head coaches here at Furman. It's off the charts. I mean, you got Matt Davidson, former professional golfer, former Furman star here. Uh, Mary's a 
you know, affirming girl, just, you know, his wife is a part of the faculty. Um, and for him to be the mentor to our student athletes, the way that he is in his humble way, uh, he's had great success and he's doing a r- remarkable job. And I think about the quality of all the coaches and the, the Jeff Holes and the Jackie Carsons and the Bob Ritchies and the Clay Hendricks, the Doug Allisons, the Andrew Burrs. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just, it's so impressive. We got a head coaches meeting tomorrow. We do once a month and touch and base and everything. But every time you get in that room, you can feel that everyone's working towards the same thing. Um, this past weekend was a great weekend. I know I, I told you I want to talk about this past weekend. It's a great weekend for Furman, you know, and you were there uh, in Charleston for the Citadel game and to see the men's basketball team play that well. Um, and they've had their ups and downs, but consistent success for them to finish with 20 wins on the season. Again, uh, I believe for Bob, it's his fourth straight time. First Furman coach in history. Which is unbelievable. Coach, yeah. You think about the, you mean, the history of the program mm-hmm. and – um, and how far back that goes, but for that to take place, um, second place finish in the Southern Conference can't be understated. I mean, it, you know, they both games with Chattanooga are one possession games, right down to the wire, uh, both at home and on the road, and they've had opportunities and couldn't be prouder of the success that programs had. And and Bob's plea, you know, you always at the end of the day, you say, what are the things that are important to you? Um, and I want to get this message across to our fan base. Bob's plea, and Jackie would say the same is we just need our Furman fans and the Furman faithful to come to Asheville this weekend and support these programs. And if you're trying to line up your weekend plans and you're putting this all together, and I know a lot of people are talking about it and making those plans, um, you know, Jackie plays on Thursday evening, on Friday. uh, Our men's team will play three consecutive evening games, Saturday night, Sunday night, and Monday night is the plan. Um, and, And for Jackie to be in the championship game noon on Sunday, and anything you can do to make that trip and grab some friends and have some fun, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have on Saturday our partners at Wicked Weed, which is a great spot in Nashville. It's a bar, to be clarified, <laughs> in Nashville. Um, but they're going to host an event midday on Saturday. This is all on the website. Uh, we're going to have send-offs for the teams on every day. Uh, we're going to have celebrations at the team hotels and around. So I think Wicked Weed is every day before the men's games. But um, I would encourage – that's the best thing you can do. A lot of times people say, "What's what can I do to support the team? Come out to the game. Be a part of the Southern Conference weekend. And I could tell through some of the questions that we had that you passed on to me, you know, some people are saying, well, what, what are the things we need to do better in terms of supporting um, these teams? And it's really it's coming out to be a part of it yeah. you know, and, and joining it. Bob was very eloquent to that point in the post-game radio interview and, and made it a point that while, yeah, many of these players have been to the Southern Conference Tournament and, and you know, this will be the fifth trip for Alex Hunter, as a group, as a team – this is this team's first time there. And, and he said, you know, I don't want to hear about 1980. Let's not talk about anything that's happened in the past. He said, let's support this group who as a unit is going there for the first time. And, and as he said, and, and we see it year in and year out, you're going to play at a neutral side event. A lot of times the energy comes down to which fan base makes it seem like more of a home court. Yeah. And that's one of the things that he talked about, our fans coming out and supporting that team. And, Jason, one of the questions that was submitted that I know that you're probably going to talk about, so we might as well address it now, is the fact that the Southern Conference Tournament always seems to fall during our spring break, which prohibits the students in mass from getting there yeah. and, and that scheduling that scheduling difficulty. Yeah, and that's, that's actually a conversation that's taking place amongst the athletic directors. I'm definitely aware of it. Um, when you look at our academic calendar, it's a challenge. And our, and our students, you know, it, it's one of those things when you're in college, it, it, I know everyone's like, oh, it's spring break, come to the basketball games. They, they in earnest, they're, they're out of here. I mean, they, when they do their planning for the year, they look at three things. They look at fall break, they look at winter break, they look at spring break, <laughs> and they, they are traveling and are about – um, and I get it, and we'll we'll look at that and continue to work with the academic side of the house in terms of what that calendar looks like and how do we emphasize um, being participants at the Southern Conference Tournament. I, I will tell you, th- this is a time, conference tournament time. We're not alone in the fact that we have spring break. Other institutions do too, um, and, and some of the other institutions are state institutions, so they're, they're carrying a larger base that travels with them relative to what they do. This is one of those times I really believe that the energy and the enthusiasm has got to come from your season ticket holder base. It's got to come from your parents, your your alumni. It's got to come from your season ticket holders. It's got to come from your regional piece. And part of it's institutionally. We, we've got to learn how to win together, how to travel together, how to go through all these things together. And, you know, I came from a basketball school. This is what I'm used to in March. It's it, There's a, 
a cadence that happens to this where people make plans to be a part of these things and they make plans. They, and this is part of what we've got to build to. We've got to make plans to be in Asheville in the first weekend in March. It's got to be a part of our DNA as an institution, the way that we're going to support each other. It's the same way we look at a football schedule. You've got to plan on, on being there for those five home games a year and into the playoffs. Um, we've got a plan to be in the NCAA tournament. You know, so everything we're doing right now behind the scenes, we always want to be about four to six weeks ahead of your team in terms of where they stand and the things that they're doing. Conversations we're having are about the Southern Conference. This organization's already been put together. Next conversation's got to be about the NCAA tournament. You know, we're, we're preparing for Selection Sunday. We're preparing for um, our team being announced in the tournament, both of the teams, the men and the women. Mm-hmm. And in the event that they're not in, we're preparing for the NIT or the next best option that we're going to have that we can participate in. Um, we're getting the gym ready. We're getting all of our uh, collateral materials ready. We're getting our travel plans ready. Um, while we're also getting ready to host the NCAA tournament. You know, we're here in Greenville, and Furman is the host um, for the tournament. So we are going to be in the tournament preparing for that as well. So we're preparing our staff. We've told all of our coaches that this first weekend of the tournament, no one can schedule home games because we can't do any more than we're going to do during this time in March. But this is a fan base plea. This, this is one of those things when you are a fan is you got to grab your friends, you got to grab your family, you got to make the trip and be a part of it. And um, I think as we learn to win together and we learn to travel together and we learn to be together, this becomes a part of the DNA in terms of what we're doing. We, we are laser focused in addition to the work that we're doing day in, day out with our student athletes, our coaches, our teams. Uh, I'm working on growing our fan base and growing the impact that Furman has in our community so that we can become that piece. And we're working on all the things that go around it. So this is just a part of that process. Um, we're also going through the process of coming back from COVID. It's going to be really nice to go to Asheville and not have restrictions or not worry about things that we've worried about in the past and still be accommodating to those things as well. But um, but I'm excited about other things we're excited about too this past weekend. Um, getting back to this great weekend, in addition to the success that men's and women's basketball had, we had a softball sweep. They, they played great. Uh, you know, Stacy Whitfield, Stacy's getting them going. She's getting them, putting it in the right spot, getting her pitching going. Uh, a friend of mine was down here playing against them recently, and I asked, "What'd you think of the program?" She goes, "They're going to be really good. They're putting the pieces together. Be, be patient with them, but they're they're growing in the right way." Um, women's tennis continues to be a dominant figure. Uh, in this, it's the same way that we feel about our women's golf team. But women's tennis, for them to beat Alabama, for them to beat a top twenty-five team in Texas Tech just speaks to the wonderful work uh, that Adam Herendine is doing with that program and the way that they're succeeding and where they're growing. Um, again, all these teams have their measurements in terms of what they're trying to do. Men's tennis, men's ten- tennis with a big win over Richmond. And uh, in our indoor track and field, we had records break broken. Uh, we had continued success. You know, our cross-country track and field program, program is built uh, for the long haul. They're built for distance running. So that's the way that they're built to win championships as they won nine straight. Um, but for them to go up on the men's and women's side to have success, to break records, and as they go through, Cameron Ponder uh, is one of our favorite student athletes. He's so supportive of everything we do, um, and he's a great he's a great role model for Furman. But for him to have another sub four minute mile is just so impressive. So just a great weekend all the way around for Furman athletics. Yeah, you just bottle that and break those out every every weekend, right? That's what we want it to be. I mean, it, <laughs> and that's that's what the build is, and that. At the end of the day, the things that we're trying to accomplish, um, you know, I told you I wanted to talk a little bit about our strategic plan. We right. we released a strategic plan in the last month. Um, I thought it was worth mentioning. It's something that our athletic department and our constituency has been working on a long time. Um, and part of why you do a strategic plan, um, and this is always the thing you do when you when you're when you're new somewhere and you're trying to build something for the long haul and you're trying to build something that is sustainable and that involves all the different stakeholders. As you go and get feedback. Uh, We had over 100 people participate in this process that were administrators, student-athletes, alumnus, coaches, student-athletes, staff, you you name it, people were a part of this process. And the overwhelming feel that we got back is just this sense of passion and a sense of commitment for what we're trying to drive to do. And and Furman's model is intended to be good in everything. So we don't – that's when people – when I got the job, people were like, what's Furman good at? I said, they're good at everything. The intent here is to have a balanced model that we're good in all these different sports – and we're continually competing for Commissioner's Cup or German Cup, um, the Commissioner's Cup on the men's side, the German Cup on the women's side, with an emphasis on revenue generation and the revenue sports. We need to be more successful than we've been to date in men's basketball and women's basketball with getting to the NCAA tournament. That is a goal. That's an aspiration that we need to work through in terms of building the brand. We want to compete in FCS football at the highest possible level and be in 
the playoffs on an annual basis each year and competing for a national championship in that space. But the model for Furman is a model that's built around academic and athletic excellence. You know, we're here uh, with the highest admission standards in the league and the highest academic standards in the league, but we're doing it on, on purpose. We're trying to get the best possible student athlete that's going to have that transformative experience, both for what they do on the field and off the field. And our investment level has got to show that. And going through a strategic planning process where you really challenge administrators and coaches and those that participate in to focus on your mission and to focus on your vision, to focus on your values is really to try to get all these things, pieces together. Because what we want to have is a weekend like we had this past weekend where everyone's doing well and everyone's doing their part and we're growing towards it. And the exciting thing for us coming up here on March, you know, there's a sense of trepidation that you're going into what could be your last weekend for basketball for some programs. That could be it. I think we're going to play past the Southern Conference one way or the other. Both teams are going to have opportunities. You're getting to the point in that year, it's that transition stage where you're working with your department where you've got all your winter sports that are finishing up their gears and you get your spring sports are starting up. you got that busy period of time. you get got football going on um, in their spring practices in terms of what they do. Uh, and volleyball and soccer are busy. So um, for us, it's a busy period of time that we're working through, but we're excited about it. This is what you want. The goal is to have your basketball teams playing as long as they can through March so they're playing to the end of the month because if we're playing to the end of the month of March, then they're competing for championships, and that's a really exciting thing for both programs to be working towards. You want to get into some of these questions? Yeah, now? let's do it. We'll jump to it. Get as many as we can in maybe in the next 10 minutes or so, and then and you'll be back next month so we can – get to any uh, ones that we don't get to today, we can get them then. But uh, I kind of combo uh, these first two questions. Um, why is the football game with North Greenville scheduled for a Thursday night? And, and, and then a kind of a, a question that goes along with that, why that game as opposed to a Division I home game? Yeah, great questions. Um, so one thing's just a little bit insight, and I feel really good about this, is that um, since I've been here as a part of the Southern Conference with the other athletic directors, our commissioner, Jim Schaus, has done a, a really strong job of prioritizing basketball in particular, the brand and what he wanted to accomplish at Southern Conference. Um, and, and probably about a year into that also, we really began some substantial conversations about the role of football in the Southern Conference, which not to say it wasn't shared as much, but it became more of a strategy. So I think strategically we're seeing an emphasis on basketball for national reputation, national regard, conference being the ninth best conference in the, in the country and the respect it's getting based on the wins and based on the rankings and to see where our teams, um, where they where they land. You know, right now where we are in the 70s, you know, we're right on the edge of being an NCAA tournament team if you go off of that. Now, they'll be at large. They'll be conference champions that get in. Um, but we look at all these different things in terms of points of emphasis on scheduling, things like that. Just recently at our last ADs meeting when we had a wrap-up from football season, we talked about everything from officials. We talked about replay. We talked about investment. We talked about facilities. And we also talked about a lot of the changes that you're going to see relative to FCS. You know, one of the things that you're seeing right now, we're at a bit of, a, of an inflection point where are you going to be all in on being FBS? You know, where are you going? And, and, and JMU, I would have told you five years ago what they were working towards. Other programs have been working towards the same thing as well. So, a number of the schools that have been competing for FCS championships in recent years are moving up to FBS to be a part of that, and it's going to create a little bit of a vacuum and an opportunity, not just for Furman, but for the Southern Conference at large. Uh, the Southern Conference should be a multi-bid league in FCS year in, year out, and part of that is scheduling. So part of what we talk about in this meeting is not wanting to play non-D1s, the, the, the importance of playing D1s, and then also taking a look at other leagues. Um, I know from a fact from being up north that when you're in – that environment, there's actually more Division One teams that you have an opportunity to play. The Ivy Leagues and the Patriot Leagues probably operate a little bit like some of the Pioneer Leagues or different schools are down here or different FCS programs that are down this way that might not have the same level of investment that some of the stronger FCS schools are. So one of the challenges you have at a Furman is you don't necessarily have people to play. Um, our staff works on scheduling about four to five years out, and they had identified this particular year as a hole in the schedule in terms of trying to get a home game. So part of the, the, having this particular game on our schedule this year was just really simply the fact that if we didn't play this game, we were going to be on the road all season, and this was an opportunity to get another home game, a fifth home game for our team. And it was a game that when you've got to entrust your coaches, you've got to have the conversation, are you prepared for what this means in terms of the big picture? At the end of the year when you look at your schedule, or do you feel strong enough that if you do the work, the body of work you need to do, that you'll have an opportunity to be a part of the FCS playoffs at the end of the day? You also got to say to your coaches, what's important to you? For Clay this year, having a home game 
a fifth home game, the ability to play on our own field in front of our own fans, to have a regional game, for him was more important this year than going on the road for an additional game just to get another game to get through that process. He believes in where he's going. He feels it's really strong to get a rhythm game going into the season early on. Um, and he wanted to get this game in on a Thursday night because a number of schools have done this to move games to Thursday before Labor Day weekend. It allows you a little bit more prep time for your next game. It gets you on the field for a game a little bit earlier. It's part of his motivation. Part of it, he wanted to try a night game before Labor Day weekend as opposed to losing folks over Labor Day weekend that may otherwise not attend. Um, for you and I, Dan, we love football. So if it's a Saturday and it's, it's, and it's August or September, we're going to be here. So we're, we're driven that way. Um, but, but he and his staff are looking at this as an opportunity to try something different on a Thursday night, to try to galvanize our student base, to try to get people behind it here, uh, both from Furman and from North Greenville, and to get a ryth rhythm game. Um, I don't anticipate playing many non-D1s. That's not, that's not our agenda. That's not our process. Um, but from time to time, if the team needs to get a home game, you may have to take one. We've turned them down, um, and we want to play D1s for the schedule. But every now and then, you've got to take one. And from a ticket sales standpoint, the anticipation is that North Greenville will sell some tickets for a yeah. Thursday night game. Yeah, Clay, Clay, that's one of the things Clay's looked at, too, is the atmosphere we're going to have with a local team. Um, and we've had other local teams that have reached out that are non-D1 that want to play. But you got to go with your coach. you got to look at what the big picture is. you got to look at the atmosphere, what you're trying to do. Um, and this program is working to build into something really special. So we, we support them in that. But yeah, tickets, tickets is a part of it. But we're, we're working towards having an environment here in Paladin Stadium and every time we play – that it becomes an event, that it becomes something special. So, you know, if you're the traditionalist football person, so well, can you get more of that on a Saturday versus a Thursday? Sure, you probably could on a weekend. But to try things and to be creative and to go outside the box is not something we're scared to do, and that's part of why we're going to do it for this year. Well, let, let, let me clue you in on a little something strictly selfishly yeah. that's going to work out in my favor. That night, September, my favor, September 1st, will be my 33rd wedding anniversary. Wow. But normally, had it fallen on, you know, it's on Thursday, and had we played on Saturday, I wouldn't be able to do anything with my wife because I have to do football. Right. Now I work on the anniversary, but we can do something for the weekend. So she's happy. Good. And you, I, you, You've made Mrs. Scott happy. Well, we're, we're, <laughs> we're happy about that. And actually, the, I guess the true answer, guys, is we did it for Dan. Yeah, there um, you go. But no, the, no, 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 did it for Angela. No, <laughs> didn't do it for Dan. <laughs> but it, that's, that's part of how Clay's looked at it. So here's an opportunity to play on a Thursday, play before Labor Day weekend, um, and to go through that process. But we're, yeah, we're open to trying things. We're open to, to, to looking at night games. We're open to looking at different opportunities for this program. Um, and football is built over the long haul. It, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we talk about FBS scheduling. I saw that was one of the questions on there. Yeah, we're, we're committed to FBS scheduling. There is a little bit of a – it's an interesting thing. If you go out to like 2026, some SEC schools are not scheduling past that point. So um, there's an undercurrent here around this constitution, con constitutional convention for the NCAA that is taking place. And the definition of some of the rules and the definition of some of the policies. And it's going to be really interesting. I alluded to this the last time we talked about what is the feedback on this relative to football. You know, all these conversations around this NCAA constitution, the NCAA – is working you know, philosophically when you look at the majority of the sports and the competitions and everything that goes on there they've got a really good system in place when you look at, at by large where they've really struggled to adjust is with football mm -hmm. football is just that you have the haves and the haves nots and there's a split that's gone down the middle that's really driven a gap um, and that's what's driven a lot of the legislation that's what's driven a lot of the changes the transfer portals the nil a lot of different things that have taken place in the past year has coming out of this conversation so this conversation about structure, about how they structure Power Five, how they structure Group Five, how we structure FCS is going to answer a lot of these questions that people have when we look at big picture for the history, for the future of college athletics. So um, it, it's a little bit of a wait and see, but part of that wait and see is going to dictate decisions that are going to take place down the road when it comes to football in general in terms of scheduling, in terms of philosophy, in terms of scholarships, all those things, investment level. Um, it's an interesting point for everybody in college athletics. Well, we do know in the immediate future, games that are on the schedule under contract, Clemson this year, and then South Carolina, yep. Ole Miss. Yep. Th those are, I think, the next three, correct? Yeah, and we've got Tennessee owes us a game return from the COVID year, so that's on the schedule coming down the road. I don't think that's been officially announced, but that's going to happen. Um, just like we've had conversations with Florida. You know, we want to have that game with Billy Napier, and he wants to do it with us. I mean, it's – there's a lot of good things that are going to take place down the road, but some of it's just a point of patience in terms of where we are 
Um, the other thing, too, is we've been trying to aggressively schedule really good FCS opponents. Mm-hmm. We've made phone calls. I, I will tell you this. I, I almost laugh at it sometimes. Some of the guys I know, they're like, oh, we're not playing you guys. You guys are too good. And it, it, sometimes it's a frustrating thing when you're talking about having a really good program because when, you're, when you have a strong brand like Furman does, it, it sometimes is a decentive when it comes to scheduling. People that want to schedule games, they want to get the win. They don't always want that rivalry game. We, we want to take on rivalry games. We want to do those things. So um, one of the disappointing things with the JMU departure is we were working on getting a home-and-home with JMU in the future. That was something on our on our list of things. So we're working on a home-and-home with a Villanova or schools like that that we want to try to get that are really good FCS games. So we're going to continue to be creative. We're watching the leagues around us in terms of what they do. We're watching very closely where the Colonial is headed. Um, we're having great conversations. So I feel really good about the work that we're doing on the scheduling front. Um, I also feel really strong about the commitment the league has to football right now. Um, each of the ADs in the room and the partnerships that are there, it's, it's, it's good. It's in, a, it's in a really good place. Um, and each of us want to win and, and figure out how to go about that the right way. Um, but I feel really good about the future of the Southern Conference. This is an opportunity for us coming up in the future FCS playoffs that we've got to be a multi-bid league uh, for the conference. And in fairness to the conference, when you lose national champions like App State, Georgia Southern over time, it takes a little bit away from the conference. The lust is the lust. I mean, the Colonial's going to lose by losing JMU. You know, whether they want to admit it or not, you're losing one of your best teams. It's going to devalue your league a little bit. You got to rebound from that and have schools that are going to start up again. But the quality of the football in our league is very good. The quality of the basketball is very is very good in our league. Um, the quality athletically across the board is really good. So um, there, there's not a particular sport in our league that is not a really good top tier league. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do at the mid-major level for college athletics. All right, let's move on uh, quickly to some other things. This question was asked by two different people, and it's kind of the kind of the same question. Talking about the possibility uh, of Furman getting involved in a either one of the existing uh, preseason mm-hmm. high-profile basketball tournaments or putting together one of our own that might kind of mimic what the old North-South challenge used to be and maybe host that at the well? Great question. Yeah, so we're, we're committed to competing at the highest possible level when it comes to our basketball schedule. And one of the goals both for Furman and for the Southern Conference is to be involved in some of these national TV multi-team tournament events. Um, a couple years ago, we had gotten the invitation to be in the Myrtle Beach Invitational event. Um, and then COVID hit, and that event went away. Technically, they owe us a spot, and we're working on our ways to get back to that, um, both for Furman and the Southern Conference. But um, w- we want to have as much national TV exposure when it comes to those type of games that we can possibly be in. And the opportunity for us to participate in an MTE is a really good opportunity. So that's one part. Um, we're open to the idea. Our, our staff had put a multiple-team multiple tournament, multiple team tournament in place this past year. That, that's an option, but it's it's much harder in this day and age to get the bigger schools to participate in those type of events. The one advantage we have with our partnership with the Bond Scores Wellness Arena is that we're actively working on some of the larger schools that will play nationally coming to play us in Greenville at the downtown arena. That is something that some of these schools will take on, uh, and we're not alone in trying to put this together. We, we'd love to get back to having a, a north-south type game or a Greenville game. We've, we've had conversations with other mid-major partners about doing this, um, in the past year, because of COVID, it was an odd time for scheduling because you were either fulfilling games that got canceled during COVID, and you had a number of teams that were coming out of that trying to reboot their schedule during a weird period of time. So uh, we had to take a step back and relook at that. But we're going to continue to be aggressive to try to find big name opponents that will come play us in the downtown uh, Greenville Arena. We're going to continue to look at tournament opportunities for ourselves in that arena, and we're going to continue to be aggressive to try to be in MTEs. Um, this is something I have teased Bob Ritchie about, um, but I've called folks that I know in basketball, and, and because of the success of the program, they don't want to play Furman. And I, and I know people look at that as, um, you know, they might say, oh, that's not, that's an excuse. It's not. I mean, it's the truth in scheduling. They, the, the other person's got to agree to play you, and the style that he plays offensively has gotten a reputation that people just don't want to prepare to defend against it, and he's become a little bit of a giant beater. Um, my friend who's the AD at Louisville texted me when they got up there, watching our team warm up. He said, we might be in trouble tonight. They, they knew that before they even played the game um, because teams can see the way that we're put together and the way that we're built and the type of opportunities we have. So we're, we're going to continue to be aggressive in that space when it comes to scheduling, and we're going to continue to be aggressive in trying to get people here on campus to play us, most likely in the Bonsacours Arena. 
Next question. Uh, someone said they thought there was supposed to be an exciting announcement regarding Furman ESP and Upstate. That announcement is coming. Yes. Don't worry about that. Uh, we, we've got to get our athletic director and our sports information director <laughs> together on, on that. It's no, all timing. No, no pressure. Uh, but that, but that announcement is coming. Uh, just okay. The deal's already been signed. We're good. So take that, uh, and and you're good for there. Um, Timetable on renovations for Timmons. Yeah, Timmons' process has been great. Um, it's it's definitely been a significant conversation with our leadership, with donors, with trustees, um, and it's moving in a really good direction. Uh, the work that got done this past year was remarkable. Um, the money that was raised very quickly was was done, and, and it shows an act of good faith. We've got some phasing that we're working through. We've got some construction documents we're working through. We've got a number of different things. At the end of the day, Timmons will be dictated by funding. It's going to be dictated by a large leadership gift that gets that project off the ground, um, or it's going to be dictated by other resources that allow that to come to fruition, and the timetable sits entirely with that process. Um, there is an appetite on the part of the university to take this on and to work on this together, um, and, and that's something that uh, our leadership, our trustees, our donors, they all want to see come to happen. Um, I've been a part of these processes before I got here, um, and it's just a matter of time, and that timeline can either happen much quicker than you expect or might take longer than you expect. Mm -hmm. Um, so I won't say it's going to happen anytime soon, but it could. You know, it's one of those things where when the funding meets all the other work that goes on around it, uh, those processes come together. In the interim, we're going to continue to work on Timmins Arena in terms of rebuilding from within the existing structure to continue to make improvements on things that we need to make improvements on as we go. But I, I don't see it happening this summer. I know it was a question that I got before. Is it going to happen? It's, it's going to take some time to get through there. Um, but continued success with the program, continued uh, commitment from our external resources and our sources such as alumni and donors, and the continued uh, work that takes place uh, internally behind the scenes is going to drive us forward. I can't wait to get to the point where we make this announcement um, that we're going to take this on, but it, it is a campaign priority for the university. So I think it's a matter of time, but it's, it's not yet. It's going to take some time before we get there. And actually, I think now we've gotten through everything on the list. The last question goes back to football and – and and uh, the uh, the fan wants to know, and I'll I'll bring this down to its its simplest form if I can, uh, be, because of circular logic is the way he put it. Where the FCS playoff is concerned, do you, you see there is there any time any way that Furman or the Southern Conference would withdraw itself from the FCS playoffs and, and do some sort of postseason scheduling alliance, kind of like the SWAC does with the Celebration Bowl and other things? Yeah, it's a good question. It was it was uh, a little bit complicated as we were reading it, but um, there's still an, a, a process that the FCS works through. I was fortunate to participate in the Regional Advisory Committee this past year, um, along with Scott Carter from ETSU, and got to see some of the inner workings of this process. Um, Having seen the process and being able to be an advocate for Furman and for the Southern Conference, I've got a clearer idea of how we go about this and what we're trying to get done. Um, I would go back to what we discussed earlier, which is the exit of some of the schools that have been committed and have had success in the FCS contributes a bit to this vacuum of opportunities that may create themselves moving forward. And I think the process in many ways in the FCS will remain the same, and it's a great, really good opportunity for Furman to capitalize on. It's a really good opportunity for the Southern Conference to capitalize on. Some of the programs that are within FCS right now are not built the same as others are built. Um, when you look at what a North Dakota has been able to do and, and financially what they're able to do around it, um, it's comparable to what I know JMU was doing in terms of their investment as a state school with resources. Mm -hmm. There's a bidding process to it. There's, an, there's a media part to it. Um, so some schools that are in an FCS are actually operating more like FBS in terms of what their commitment and investment level is. So I think you're going to see a little bit of a wrecking here in the future. I think you're going to see a leveling out. What I mean by that is you're going to have these top-tier, you know, power five schools are going where they go. And you got these group of five schools in the middle that got to figure out, are they going to stay with that? Are they going to do this? Or where, where is this all going to go? Um, but I think time will tell in terms of what the future is for FBS football, what the future is for FCS football relative to that. And I think for the moment we're going to stay the course in terms of what we're doing. One of the things that's going to come out of this constitutional convention is going to be more authority and more uh, opportunity for conferences to really regulate and figure out what they are and where they want to go. So is the question of, of a celebration bowl out of the question taking place? It, it's not. Uh, but I think the goals for the football program right now, Furman football, is to win a national championship at the FCS level, and I don't think that's changed. 
I think what's changed is the model around us and our ability to adapt to be successful within it. So um, our standards are still the same. It, it's to compete for championships mm -hmm. year in, year out uh, in basketball and football and everything else that we do. Um, that's the standard, and, and I'm confident in what Clay's plan is and where we're going. But um, I don't think you're going to see that today. I'm not saying it won't change, but it's going to be really interesting when we sit down in September, Dan, and talk about all the things that transpire over the next – four to five months because there's a lot that's about to happen here if they stay on the timetable that they've said they're going to stay on. And it's going to impact not just us, but it's going to impact Alabama. It's going to impact Clemson. It's going to impact App State, Georgia Southern. It's going to impact everybody, Furman, Wofford, William & Mary, you name a program. It doesn't matter who you are. And there's, there's some schools that are at a lot of risk right now in terms of their investment level to figure out where they are. Um, we're really well positioned for our model for what we want to do and, and where we're going to go. Well, I, I hope that uh, we were able to get – answers to all of your questions. I think we got to everything that was submitted, and a good thing about it is we'll be doing this again next month, and we'll put out the call for more questions then, and by then we will uh, we'll be able to talk about hopefully a lot of success from our basketball teams. Yeah, we could still be playing. You know, we could be sitting That'd here be nice, a, wouldn't it? a month from now, and, and you just don't know where we are, but um, you know, as we look ahead for the month ahead, um, again, the Southern Conference Tournament for both the men and the women is the most important thing that we're doing within the next week, and we need your support. Uh, our coaches uh, greatly appreciate our student athletes. And if you can galvanize the community in that direction, that is priority number one as we look ahead. We would love to celebrate with all of you uh, at a selection Sunday in the near future for both the men and the women. Uh, and we'll keep you posted on that if we're fortunate enough to advance. But we do expect, expect to play in the postseason on both the men's and women's side based on the quality of work that they've both done. Um, and we'll be interested to see where that happens. Um, we encourage you to enjoy uh, this NCAA tournament that's taking place in Greenville in mid-March. And what a great opportunity for, for Furman, for the Southern Conference, for the Bond Scores Wellness Arena, and for the city of Greenville to enjoy what was a great weekend before uh, the last time the NCAA tournament was here. But we hope that you'll come out and enjoy that. It's, first, it's a first site that sold out nationally, um, which I think speaks a lot to the passion for basketball in this region. And then the final thing, just to get it on your radar, is we're going to have a fun spring football game um, what it consists of, whether it's a game or a scrimmage or, or just some activities that take place. But on Saturday, March 25th, uh, we're going to wrap things up with football for this year with a fun spring game that we're going to really encourage our students and fans to come out and have some fun with, and we'll hope that you'll enjoy that with us. Um, but we're excited for the rest of the month of March, and uh, we don't know where we're going to be or what it's going to look like, um, but we're committed and excited about it. I know, Dan, I, your, your calendar, God only knows where you're going to be <laughs> and what you're going to do, but I, I wish you well, and, and I hope you do have a, a happy event or anniversary in September because you've put a lot of hours in, a lot of mileage in this year, and uh, we appreciate you. It's what we do, yes. you know. I uh, wouldn't have it any other way, and I, I hope that the, uh, the basketball season extends where we're putting in more mileage and more hours and, and going. On. And by the way, that Saturday is March 26th. March 26th, yes. thank you. Yep. Yeah, March yeah, that shows you, we're, we're, you. You scared me for a minute. when we're, I. We're all, we're all over the place. <laughs> all right, anything else that we need to wrap up? No, just thank you for everyone, everyone's support. Uh, it's been a fun year. We're excited about where we're headed next. Um, we've had some awesome experiences so far this year. We want to continue to finish it strong in, in our winter sports and then transition into a fun spring with our spring sports. Sounds good. Jason, as always, thank you so much. We appreciate the time. Looking forward to doing it again next month. Any questions, comments? You can see the email address bottom left of your screen, dan.scott at Furman.edu. Please send them along, and we'll get ready for the next time Jason is here. Uh, in early April, this is actually the March get-together one day early. So we'll do that in early April. Ba back next week with another edition of Inside Furman Athletics. Until then, for Jason and everybody here at Furman, I'm Dan Scott saying God bless you. So long, everybody.